So Jan might be re marooned in Scotland for the next couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think I'm going to just activate this and start. Um, okay. let, me, let, me, let me get it uh, going from beginning. Okay, and let me now go down to the bottom here. Uh, hang on. Getting this confused. Share screen. Share screen two, share. Okay. Now let's go to uh, from beginning. Oh, there's one. <laughs> I like that, Batik. <laughs> okay. This is going to be a, uh, a slideshow from, or a show from uh, Cambodia, of which I went to a couple of years ago. And it's officially called the Kingdom of Cambodia. Um, what you end up having is, and this is a little bit of a history lesson, um, this is the Southeast Asian area, and this map was from about the year 1000. And the red part, what you're seeing there, is what is called the Khmer uh, Empire. And this was an empire that stood for a very long time until from about... If you, if you don't mind, if you hit some of your mutes, I'd appreciate it. Um, but anyway, the Khmer Empire was a very, very large empire, and it covered all of Thailand, Laos, uh, part of Vietnam, pieces of it, and uh, obviously Cambodia. And the center of it was what is called the Angkor, uh, was the name of the, the, the town or the, center, the centerpiece. The leader or the man who started the Khmer um, Empire's name was J Jayavarman, and he was the founder. And uh, it went for about 500 years, the empire. Uh, so uh, for empires, that was a long time because America's only been around for a couple of hundred years. So uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, the key in Cambodia, and the, the white part or the beige part is Cambodia, is that there is a river that flows through the center of it that starts in Tibet and goes through China and that eventually goes through the center of Cambodia and that goes out into Vietnam and out into the Southeast Sea and that is the Mekong River. It's 2,700 miles long. Uh, you're going to see it in a bunch of pictures but it's, it's the life source of most of Southeast Asia. Um, you can see there, we ended up flying into Bangkok, as I said a few minutes ago, and uh, because that is the cheapest flights to get to Asia, Southeast Asia. It's usually about $800 out of San Francisco. And then we flew to a town called Sim Reap. And Sim Reap um, is in Cambodia, and that is where Angkor Wat and a lot of the places are. It's the center part of Angkor, of, of the place. Cambodia is officially called the Kingdom of Cambodia. Uh, so when you arrive, that is the official name. So as we leave the airport, this is my first introduction into uh, Cambodian life. And uh, so you've got your typical uh, farmer here. And this turned out to be a lotus farmer. On one side of the road, he was, uh, had his, uh, his cattle. And on the other side, this was his house. So uh, I, on one of the other um, slideshows, I mentioned that uh, one of the keys for me always is a taxi driver. So at the airport, when we got off the airplane, I immediately got a taxi driver who you'll in be introduced to in a little bit. Um, but as we're leaving the airport, we passed this place and I said to him, stop, I want to see how these people live. And so this is your typical farmer. And you can see that basically it's a flat board, bunch of flat boards and everybody's laying around most of the time. But this guy was what's called a lotus farmer. So I walked out on his pier because he had this large area that was swampy and they're growing lotuses, lotus plant. And the lotus plant is used for a lot of different things. There is the lotus plant. The centerpiece is actually used for food. Um, the stock is used for many different things. In the Myanmar presentation I, I showed you, the stock uh, is also used to make cloth. So these farmers that live in these in these areas, they just eke out a very small living off of this one plant. 
So as we arrive in Sim Reap, this is our hotel. Um, it was about $70 a night called the Gulf Anchor. It's just a, a nice hotel. Our taxi driver is the gentleman there you can see off to, and he's driving a Lexus. So when I walked outside out of the airport, I have my typical question. I said, you know, who speaks English? Yes. Okay. And how much are you for all day? So he was $40 all day. So we ended up giving him $80 <laughs> for all day. We doubled it because it was so unbelievably cheap. And so he would pick us up in the morning from our hotel and he was there with us all day long when we had questions or anything to do. Um, but it, an amazing gentleman, uh, his name is Ian Lay and he is still part of my um, Facebook group. So he took us the next day to what is called Angkor Wat, which is what everybody wants to see when they go to Southeast Asia or Cambodia especially. And this is a little bit of a, a picture to give you an idea of the size. You can see at the bottom there where my pointer is, that is actually Angkor Wat. The upper part is Angkor Tom. And so uh, you're going to see pictures from all the different places, um, but it, 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 this is to give you an, a little bit of an overview. You can also see the rivers that are coming into this, which you'll eventually understand that this is how everything was built was through the river complex. Here is Anger Wat. And obviously I didn't take this picture, but this, this was a, a little bit of a depiction to give you a feel of how massive it is. It's the largest religious complex in the world. It took 37 years to build. And it was built in the year 1100. And the gentleman's name was Jayavarman II. And he was the ruler who built this. Um, and he took a piece of jungle basically and he carved this out of it and how anger Wat has survived throughout these years because eight months of the year they get no rain so what he was smart enough for the people there were smart enough to understand was they had to have water around what they were building to keep the soil moist so in the summertime or excuse me in the winter time when it was the dry season they wouldn't uh, contract and uh, tear itself apart so all of this, um, all of this architecture you're going to see is always water oriented because the water is the driving force that keeps everything together over there. Just as a, a, a side point, when they built Anger Wat in the year 1100, there were about a million people living in this area. Um, and at the same time, London had about 50,000. So you get a, a relationship of how much labor was available to build this. And when you were king, they were all slaves. And so, you know, that's to build this is just, it's unbelievable. And the people thought of their leaders as gods. So this gentleman uh, was a god. So you did everything for the god. What we are doing now, or what the um, Americans and uh, the world is doing, there is a technology called LIDAR, L-I-D-A-R, which is going to be used in all the autonomous cars that uh, are, we're going to be driving, or they'll be driving us in a couple of years. Uh, LIDAR is now also used to fly over these areas like the Mayan ruins, and they've done this now over Angkor Wat, and this is how they're able to see where all the roads were and where all the housing was. So when you have a chance later on, go to YouTube, put that LIDAR in, L-I-D-A-R, and uh, put Angkor Wat, and you'll see some unbelievable um, footage of the area of what it originally looked like, of how you could have a million people living in the jungle, where now the jungle is basically taking it over. So here we are at Angkor Wat, and this is, I'm on the outside wall, and that waterway is what you saw before this surrounds Angkor Wat. What I didn't know the day we arrived was that this was the beginning of Chinese New Year. <laughs> and so China being right next to, to Cambodia and the Chinese have a little more money now, it was so crowded the first couple of days. But as soon as Chinese New Year went away, it was uh, back to, to the normal, uh, normal times. Angkor Wat, by the way, is uh, originally when they built it was a Hindu temple and it was built in an east-west configuration. 
uh, it was for built for the god Vish Vishnu, um, and it was Hindu for about 400 years until the Buddhists, until, for whatever reason, the Hindus gave it up and the Buddhists uh, end up taking it over. Hang on. My, my computer just froze a little. There we go. Um, this again is Anger Wat and uh, the main entrance into it. In the middle of Anger Wat, um, where the leader lived and uh, where everything goes, because it was Hindu, it was water oriented. So the center of Anger Wat has four large pools in it. Um, and they're no longer filled with water, haven't been since the 15th century because the Buddhists are not water. They're more uh, spiritual. So when this was built as a Hindu temple, this was water oriented. So you can see the one of the water pools. This again is one of the four pools. You can see the stairway that the king would have walked down into should go swimming in his pool. We're standing just on the outer lip of it. Uh, just as a reference point, my brother is on the right and uh, another friend of ours is in the center there. Uh, there are also a series of temples inside of Angkor Wat that these were uh, libraries, and so they they recorded everything, uh, and they would record things on bamboo, and so the monks would write things. But these these temples inside, there were small temples inside of Angkor Wat. So much of Anger Wat um, has been torn apart uh, because for about 300 years it sat um, after the uh, Khmer Empire collapsed uh, before in the 1800s when uh, the uh, British explorer found uh, Anger Wat again and they found it total, almost totally covered in trees uh, because the jungle just took it back over but so much of it you're going to see is just torn apart and they're slowly putting it all back together. The Sandstone is the primary stone that they used in the, in the carvings. And the carvings in this place are just, you could spend months just looking at the carvings, understanding their wars uh, between their, their different people because everything is depicted on their walls. This was a, a typical touristy shot where, you know, the local women uh, come out and they take a picture or you take a picture of, of yourself. Uh, inside of Anger Wat, over the last 800 years or so, you can look at the bottom of these columns and they're eroded, and that's mostly water erosion uh, because these, these individual stones, which were the sandstones, uh, being sandstone being uh, uh, soft, uh, gets eroded. And the, when they were laid on top of each other, they really didn't use any kind of a mortar. Everything was laid and precisely cut so that the joints are so tight that I would look for joints and you couldn't find the joints uh, in so much of this construction. Uh, there's a monk uh, who is doing prayers for us, um, and so he would read off of these bamboo scrolls um, and read your prayer. There was one of the prayers, obviously I didn't know what he was saying, but uh, I listened and uh, it was just a, a very nice thing for him to do. Again, inside of Angkor Wat, uh, these are the, the, the buildings. You can see the inside uh, of the building is sandstone, but there's another stone called laterite that they used as an exterior. So the whole thing is laterite on the outside and sandstone on the inside. Another library, um, the kings were famous for building libraries and pools because again, it was the Hindu religion. Um, as we're leaving Angkor Wat, this is the main entrance onto, in, into it in the waterway that surrounds it. There was a typical Cambodian wedding and they were using it as a backdrop, which is uh, very, very nice. Typical cheesy, <laughs> uh, um, a tourist shot, but I had to stand there and uh, have Anger Wat in the background. So uh, it's just a, it's a, it's an amazing place. Like I said, nothing more to be said than amazing. 
So back to the map. Again, you can see where Anger Wat was or is at the bottom there, relatively small. Right above it is a thing called Angor Tom, which is a larger facility than Anger Wat, hardly talked about, but it's as spectacular, if not more spectacular, than Anger Wat. So right now, the next series of pictures you're gonna see is um, the area going into Anger Tom. So this is the waterway again that surrounds Anger Tom. And there's a bridge that they built uh, with the statues that you walk to enter into um, Anger Tom. These are the uh, pieces that you see along the side of the bridge. Again, these are, again, no, no mortar being used. Everything was cut so precisely, but here you can see the, the connection lines. This is one of the four entrances into Anger Tom. Um, the Cambodians have made it so you can actually drive in because it's too far to walk. Um, according to the scholars here, the king, King Jayavarman, uh, that is his face. And you're going to see in most of the architecture as we go through this Anger Tom, the centerpiece is called Bayon. And there are 216 faces in this Anger Tom area. And it is always all of King Jayavarman. Uh, it is his depiction of what he looked like. So this is all inside of Anger Tom. And most pictures of what people see of the trees that are uh, going over the top of these ruins uh, are, is in Anger Tom. Uh, because so much of Anger Tom, when they found it, was covered in uh, a jungle again. And the trees had literally, as you can see, ripped this stuff apart. And slowly, they're piecing it back together to try to give everybody a feel of what the area was like. This again, you can see originally was a tree, obviously had ripped this apart. This was a giant stone pile. You're gonna see this before, uh, later on, where, where mankind now has put it back together, but have not nearly the skill level that they had at that time, because they were able to build it at, where you couldn't see the joints and that we would have to use mortar, but they tried to make it look as close to uh, what it originally was like. This is one of the trees that uh, obviously that we all see in pictures of the area of Anger Tom. Um, this tree is called a silk cotton tree. And there is another one called a tick tree, which really doesn't mean anything to us. But obviously birds over a couple of hundred years poop on all this stuff and the, the seeds come out and the seeds grow and give it a couple hundred years before you know it. The uh, beautiful temples are covered in these trees and they have left some of them to give this look. Uh, but so much of this, this is why these uh, facilities are all torn apart. There is another tree that uh, you can see is still there that uh, has taken these walls and um, they're slowly piecing it back together. If you look at most of the blocks that are on the ground there, you can see all the holes drilled in them. Those were holes that were drilled by the people who built Anger Wat, Anger Tom, because this had to be transported and had to be moved. And so they would drill holes into the sandstone and this is how they would move it. So it would be bamboo and they would lash it together and how they could move it. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's technology we don't use anymore. We're, th we're so much smarter, but they did a much better job. Some of the carvings on the walls, I mean, these, the, again, like I said before, um, it, it's all of their battle scenes and their uh, heritage and everything that they were about at the time, whether it was the slaves uh, that they had, that they decapitated, or they, they, they were brutal people. I mean, lobbing off a nose or ears for a, a little offense was not a big deal. And this is all depicted in these walls. This was one of my favorite, uh, a tree that had obviously uh, grown. And I don't know if somebody did this obviously many years ago, but the tree, they left a small little face coming out of the tree. And it was just very, very comical, very nice. 
another beautiful, this one here, you can see there's more tightly, uh, um, tight, <clears throat> tight joints. I mean, these trees are just massive when they, when they uh, grow on top of this, uh, this architecture. This is the middle of Anger Tom, and this is called the Bayon Temple. Uh, this was the king's temple, uh, King Jai of Arman, and this is where he lived. Um, and it's a temple still in relatively good condition. Um, you'll see up at the top there, his likeness. Uh, and you'll see them all the way through uh, this temple area. He had 206, like I said before, 216 uh, likenesses of himself put into his temple. So reasonably narcissistic, <laughs> but, but uh, a king would be that. Again, another shot of Bayon Temple. I mean, just an amazing temple in the middle of Anger Tom. So much of Anger Tom and the surrounding areas, again, is slowly being pieced together. This is what it would have looked like a couple hundred years when somebody came by, where a tree was on top of it, just torn it apart, and it was just all dropped there. There is, you can still see a tree that they left at the top, who, you know, is just slowly, just, te again, tearing it apart. Around Anger Tom is a very large, wall. And again, all of these walls are not just walls. Everyone is a depiction of a scene. And this, you'll see elephants in the center of almost all of these depictions, because so much of Anger Tom and Anger Wa when they built it, was built by elephants. Because to move these massive pieces of stone, obviously mankind, you know, there were a lot of people, but the Egyptians I'm sure they used elephants, but the Thais use a lot of elephants. And so you see this depiction over and over again. So there you can see again, uh, Cambodia as a country, um, Angkor Wat. You can see that uh, in a few minutes, we're going to go to a place called the Tonlesap Lake. Uh, but right now we're going to go up to the second arrow um, and that second arrow is relatively nondescript, but tourists don't go here. But I wanted to go to areas that tourists don't go. So I said, show me another one of these temple areas. So we drove up with a taxi man to another one of these temples to, to see more authentically what, has it, what does it look like? You know, not made for tourists. This is again, in, in the next couple hundred years, they're going to piece all this stuff back together to see how spectacular it was. But these are the ruins of another major area in the northern part of Cambodia, uh, where trees, you can see small trees are just, you know, over the thousands of years tearing it apart. Here I am putting the stone back, <laughs> thinking I'm going to make a difference. But it was just, I wanted to see how did they make this stone work. And so if you notice, I tilted it backwards. You can see that there is a piece at the bottom of that stone that they would fit tightly into that hole and that held that stone in place. Um, these are, you'll see these all over these temples. These are spirits um, and they're called Nagas, N-A-G-A, and you'll see them all over Cambodia. It's, uh, I don't understand all their, their spirits, but uh, it is a spirit. <laughs> Again, one of the temples, the carvings, the temples, I mean, they're just it, it, you can spend a lifetime trying to decipher all of these uh, designs because to have spent as much time as they have uh, to do these carvings out of stone and then stack them and get them to work absolutely flawlessly. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a work of art. This is the centerpiece of this temple. As you can see, the trees have tore it apart, so it collapsed inward because for those three, 400 years where nobody cared, it just, uh, the jungle took it back. But this was an area that's a little more authentic and uh, you'll see this all over Cambodia. Here we're leaving one of these ruin areas and I wanted to see, because Cambodia is made for their silk. And so I wanted to see how is silk made? Well. <laughs> these are silkworms, and you'll see the real ones later on, but these are, after a silkworm builds a cocoon, um, the cocoons are set there to dry, and then the girl takes them and she boils them, and then she takes the silkworms and she starts 
piecing, pulling threads out, and they start putting them together. And they start putting them into these large spinning wheels to try to get it into a form where eventually somebody can start to put it into a spool that can be used to make shawls, to make silk things. But this is the process, the worm, the drying, the spinning of putting it together. And it was, it was interesting to me. So these are the ladies who are, you can see on the bottom, the silk that is coming in and you can see how many strands of silk, each one is off of one of those spools coming in and they're guiding it in this huge circular loom is making a shawl. <laughs> I mean, we buy a shawl and we go, okay, that's only $100, but they have no concept of how much time it makes takes to make a, shirt, a silk shawl. So we have now left that area of Prey Vanar up at the top. We're back in Sim Reap. So where we're going now is to the Tondla Sap River and uh, the Tondla Sap Lake. A quick explanation. The Mekong River, which you see on the right hand side, the major river, that is the river that flows, as I said, from China all the way through Cambodia, through Vietnam, and into the, into the sea. The only part of that that is lower in elevation than the Mekong River is the Tunla Sap Lake. So in the wintertime, when the Tunla Sap level goes down, the Tunla Sap Lake starts to flow empty, or not totally empty, but empty, and heads down the Mekong and heads into the sea. In the summertime, when the rains come, obviously all of the Mekong River starts to flow, and then it backflows into the Tonla Sap Lake, and it fills it back up. On the Tonla Sap Lake, you have close to a half a million people that live on this lake, which you're going to see in a minute. So I am there in November, December. It's, it's winter time, which is their dry season. So um, in my naivety, I thought we could go down the Tonla Sap Lake and go all the way down to Nam Pen, which is further down the lake. But so... The next slide you're going to start to see is the beginning of the Tundla Sap Lake, which was the water source for Anger Wat, which was where also the kings got their water source beyond the rivers uh, when they were building all of these temples. So here we are now on the shores of the Tundla Sap, realizing that like our lakes, our lakes in America kind of stay at the same level. Well, I didn't know that the Tonla Sap uh, drains itself in the winter time because it's going to the sea. So now we've got a muddy mud pile. So we rent a, one of these boats from a local and we say, you know, can you take us down to, to uh, Nam Pen? And they said, no, said, no, 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 because you're going to see the tunnel, the, uh, uh, the lake is relatively shallow now. These boats um, and Ranger will appreciate this. This is the outdrive of the boat. And so you can see the string attached to it and they raise and lower this de depending on the depth of where they are so they can pass these shallow areas. As we leave uh, the northern part of the Tonla Sap Lake, you start to see the half a million people that are living on this lake, but they all live on stilks because the Tunla Sap Lake, when it fills up, fills up to the bottom of their houses. So oh. they can only live there for a couple of months uh, and walk down. The rest of the time, they need a boat to get around. Mm. Uh, here's your typical housing as you go into the Tunla Sap. Uh, the key here is that these people, it costs them nothing to live there because they build this themselves. Everything is on stilks. When you're not living on the land, the land is not owned by anybody. So these lakes, you get half a million people living in these ho this housing on the lake. Their boats are at the bottom, obviously, because this is how they fish, how they do everything. Again, same thing. You can see all the housing very high. They're fishing 
uh, this is Nets next to it. One of the things that they, these areas do have, which is surprising, is electricity. You can see that they're all connected to electricity. Many of them have cell phones, so they have internet. Many of them have TVs because they can see the rest of the world, but they see how they live and how the rest of the world lives. So as we're going out, here's a guy doing some repair work, not the most designated repair facility in the world, but he has to do, he has to clean his boat and repair the bottom of it. So as we're going out again, um, uh, what do they have? They have a television. You can see they've got electricity. They've got a, you know, they, they're living relatively free and uh, they don't ask for very much. So as we get halfway out onto the lake, uh, our driver says, would you like to see the village? Uh, because it's dry right now. And I said, sure. So they pulled over. And so here is the village that uh, eight months of the year is dry and four months of the year, there is water to the bottom of it. So we walk around and we see a uh, school. So we walk up to the school. So the school here, everybody's shoes are on the outside because obviously being very dusty, they don't want to uh, contaminate the inside. And being Buddhist now, they're very respectful of their elders and the schools. So here is a school a typical school, you can see everybody, they may live a hovel existence, but they're very proud of their kids, very clean uh, floors, uh, white shirts, uh, uh, uniforms. And so one of the things that we were told that bring them something. So my brother and I, we brought them a bunch of uh, paper and pencils. And there is a teacher you can see in the background, very thankful that we brought them supplies because in their meager existence, this stuff is hard to get to come by. So here, this is again, walking through the town, you can see Dan there showing what the level of the water is four months of the year. So their septic system, I know you're thinking about this, but their septic system in the dry time, they actually in this area have septics, but in the winter time, when the water comes up that high, septic doesn't work obviously. So uh, it is the lake that becomes the repository of everything. <laughs> um, there again is uh, a, a relatively nice house. You can see on the right hand side, all of the wood because wood is very precious because obviously they have no money. And when you have no money, propane is expensive, right? And so wood is something that they use for cooking. So uh, a stack of wood is very, very, you're, you're a wealthy person with a stack of wood. So as we start to go out on the lake, you can see the boats in the background. And I also, this was more tourist bound, but uh, the lake has alligators in it. And you can see them inside this cage. There are turtles and these got these for a few tourists that come by to see the tourists, to see the alligators and the, uh, the turtles. So as we're going out a little bit further, you know, this again, half a million people, you gotta think about all live on this lake. So here it is, a boat who's trying to get out in the shallow area. He's got his outdrive. He's pulled it way up. So it's churning through the mud uh, just to be able to get out. One of the fishermen coming in off the lake, um, and he has caught whatever he's caught during his day. You can see his fishing net on the backside, and they've got a few fish to be able to feed their families, and that's all they need. So as a tourist, this is your typical tourist bathroom, you know, for a, a, for a Cambodian, it's a joke. But for, for us, we look at it as a joke too. But it's basically a hole in the ground where you put your foot on either side. A, on the right, left-hand side of Dan there, you can see a little container of water where you just uh, wash it, wash whatever you're doing away. But this is considered a nice um, tourist bathroom. <sighs> So here we are, we have now left the Tundla Sap Lake area, which you can see above there. We've gone from the Tundla Sap, uh, we took a bus down to Phnom Penh. And Phnom Penh, an interesting thing is that uh, it was a town in the 1970s that I'll show you later, um, was emptied, a town of, I don't know, three or four million people that was em emptied by the ruler, his name was Pol Pot. 
who decided that uh, the city people, the intellectuals all needed to live in the country. So he killed uh, like 2 million people and he emptied Phnom Penh and told them to go live in the countryside. But you'll see this as we go. So we're now in Phnom Penh. Phnom Penh is now a pretty large town again, two, three million people. Uh, our hotel is the yellow hotel in the background. I made a booking there, had no idea again that they were gonna have a parade. So the night we arrived, here we have a parade. So outside of our hotel is this wonderful parade going by a Cambodian parade, which is very interesting. So just, just, amazing, the young people, everybody, festivities is something Cambodians live for. So our taxi driver, uh, being a, uh, somebody that I, I chose, he spoke English, we liked him, we negotiated for the price. He says, would you like to go to my friend's wedding? And I said, really, a Cambodian wedding? I said, he said, sure. He said, so well, that evening, we went to a Cambodian wedding. So an interesting piece about this wedding was, uh, you're going to see a couple of pictures, is that uh, uh, um, karaoke is very much the, the, the theme. So uh, for the next couple of hours, you get to listen to karaoke while people are getting drunk. So everyone's, <laughs> everyone's drinking beer. And as they're drinking beer, what do you do with the empties? What do you do with the empties? You throw them under the table. So as the evening went on, the tables, every one of these tables, including mine, just had this stack of glass and empty bottles underneath <laughs> it. it. It's just just crazy. But I went with the flow and this was, uh, you know, it's like eating. Here was the meal. I mean, uh, do you want to eat one of their fish? You know, I mean, I would eat the noodles, I'd eat the vegetables, but no, ain't gonna eat their fish because I know where it comes from. <laughs> So this, again, it was just very pleasant and very nice to be able to be invited to it. And there are many more pictures of this wedding, but I didn't add them all to it. So the next day we're walking around Nam Pen and we wanted to see what the street food was. Again, this is street food. So if you want to eat, here is you can get a fried fish and you can get whatever you want off the vendors that are selling it to you. Here's the vendor stands. And it costs so little because this is how the Cambodians, the, to them, this is eating out because they will spend a little bit of money and these vendors are looking for somebody to come by. These ladies are trying to sell some fish here, but one of the things to think about, it's 85 degrees out, right? And these bamboo baskets are sitting outside and they're wanting you to buy their fish. Well, <laughs> not part of my diet. <laughs> So would you like some chickens? The chickens, you know, with a few flies on it, you know? I mean, it, again, 85 degree heat and this, but you know, it doesn't bother them. Their stomachs are different. But I did buy, I did buy a, a really nice meal, and, but it was all vegetable based. And, uh, but this is where you would eat. So you had mats in the middle of, of the area in Nam Penh, of this uh, uh, area. And families would sit down and we sat down and we'd have a couple of beers and we had our lunch. And I mean, it, it's a, again, very, very nice uh, family oriented place. One of the things we all need when we go, and especially people with no hair, because you don't want long hair, is a haircut. So in Phnom Penh, I, you know, I, I don't know, it cost a dollar or whatever it was uh, for a haircut. And then they said, would you like your ear cleaned? And I, I've never had my ears cleaned. I said, okay, fine. So this woman go, proceeds to get these tools out. And I was actually freaking out to start out with because uh, she can hit my eardrum. But anyway, she cleaned my ears and took my few hairs that I have left in my ears away. So if you remember before, um, I, I showed you the lotus farmer and the center part of the lotus plant. Here we are driving out of Phnom Penh here. And I took this picture because this was a guy who was selling the center part of the lotus plant uh, because wow. this is edible, that's what they eat. As, as we're driving to the airport to leave the area, um, this guy, this is typical, and I was able to get a picture of this. This would be a tuk-tuk. So he's basically got a Honda 50 that he has made this contraption on the back of it that he can take people around. So for a few 50 cents or whatever, he'll drive you around. But again, you got to remember it's 85, 90 degrees. So this 
guy in his little 50 cc moped has a water tank strapped to the side that he is always dripping onto his transmission because transmissions will start to overheat especially when you get a couple of tourists in the backside and he's moving you around so it was just very interesting to me another typical cambodian you know they they have a uh, may have a motorcycle or a moped or a little 50 cc but you know we have our laws here you can't put more than two people on well there's no law there so you know you got four people on this little moped going down the street so as we're heading out of town or out towards the airport, we saw this uh, guy selling a bunch of furniture and it was just interesting to me to, again to see their furniture, which is horrid, big bulky furniture. Behind their, their furniture shop, I want to see what are they eating? Well, they were cooking up a, a dessert and this is a banana dessert that they were cooking. So, um, here, what we're doing is, uh, before we got to the airport, we ended up, he said, would you like to see another silk farm, the taxi guy? Yes, I absolutely. I said, how can we get there? And he says, well, by ferry. So here we are getting onto a local ferry, not a tourist ferry, to go up to a uh, silk farm. So here we are with the guy with his loom on the back and a car and a donkey uh, going up the Mekong so as we're going up the Mekong, you again, this is the Mekong in the background, you can start to see how low it is right now because the Mekong comes to where that cow is stepping off. So it's a huge river that obviously comes up. One of the things on the Mekong that you'll see a lot is that being a huge river and when it flows to the ocean, the Vietnamese and the Chinese are not allowed to go to Cambodia, but many families do because they're so poor. So this, this boat right here has a family aboard, so which is hard to believe. But I was able to grab a picture of one. Here is a husband a wife and a couple of kids who have floated down or come down the Mekong and they're right now in Phnom Penh because they're looking for food, they're looking to make some money, uh, but they're just floating down. But these are what they call the illegal migrants uh, of uh, Cambodia because they're really not allowed to be there. So what you see here are these illegal people uh, who basically would be harassed by the Cambodians, but they float down, they attach to the walls in Phnom Penh, they go up and during the evening and they will go buy some groceries. So they go back onto the river and they'll continue back to wherever they're going to go, either to a lake like uh, the Tongla Sap or whatever. But there, you'll see many of these families in these boats that are just uh, floating down the river. So where I, was, where I was originally going was uh, to the silk farm, because I, again, wanted to see another silk farm. These are, again, the actual uh, silk cocoons. Here is the silk worm, and this woman is feeding a mulberry leaves, and that's what the silkworms eat, and which eventually where silk comes from. And this silk farm, again, was showing the silkworms, uh, the thread being pulled off of them, but here is the Cambodian silk. Um, I mean, it's some of the most beautiful silk that you'll ever see um, if it's the real silk, Cambodian silk, because the time that it takes to make this is just, it's staggering. And we go, $100 for that? I don't think I'll spend that. <laughs> but it's, anyway, it's, it's, it's such beautiful artwork. And these women literally will spend a month making one of these shawls. <laughs> So in Phnom Penh, one of the other things I wanted to go, and I always like doing this, is whether it's Myanmar, Thailand, whatever, and this is a, an American thing to do, is to go to a cooking class. So I, in Phnom Penh, I wanted to go to a cooking, cooking class, but this is obviously made for tourists. Um, so here is our teacher, and cooking class meant that we needed to go buy our own uh, food. So I told her I wanted a vegetarian. So she's picking out fruits and vegetables for me as we're going through this market. So again, this market had chickens. Well, did you want some of the chickens with the flies on it or the ones sitting around? Or mm -hmm. did you want some of the beef that is being hung out in the 85 degree heat in this market? 
So I didn't want any of it. All I wanted was vegetarian. And so here I am with this German guy, obviously it looks like me on the other side, um, <laughs> who uh, we're starting to make uh, our food. The first thing that we made was a salad. This was a mango, carrot, red, pepper, mint salad. Um, this was our main dish, a uh, banana leaf wrap. And I honestly don't remember what was inside of it. Um, the dessert was a mango dessert with a coconut sauce. And so you got to eat that. So it was, a, anyway, as a meal, it was just a, a fun thing to be able to do in Phnom Penh. So we, as we're leaving Phnom Penh, one of the things that you, everybody wants to see is, um, is anything to do with the war. And so I really didn't want to go see the skulls and the killing fields, so I let that go. But I really was interested in the war memorials because the war was something that we all lived through in the 1970s through 1980s, early 80s. So this is, I'm going to show you some of the remnants of the Russian uh, armaments that was used against the Americans at the time. This is a, uh, a MiG helicopter, uh, an MI-8, uh, 19, uh, anywhere, Russian helicopter with a MiG you can see in the background. You'll see it again in a second. But uh, this was a really tough period for the uh, Cambodians. Uh, here, what we have is uh, the artillery, the anti-craft artillery that would try to shoot American planes down. Um, this gentleman right here, we got to know him a little bit. Here was our guide around. His name was Month Synthoth. Anyway, he was a Cambodian soldier who fought against the Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge was the communists who, who took over, basically took over Cambodia. And he, sh he himself had a prosthesis leg because he, he lost it in a landmine. And he was shot three times which, I mean, he showed us his wound, unbelievable. But they had showing us the weapons the Cambodians used. These are mortars, various Russian uh, mortars that were used against the Americans. My friend Dan, you know, we're just amazed at the, there's some landmines and miscellaneous uh, artillery that uh, the Cambodians had left. This is a Russian T-54 tank. Um, that was used that is now obviously just a, a heap of, of rust. Uh, my brother's standing in front of a, uh, a rocket launcher. This is a Russian uh, BM-14 rocket launcher um, that the Cambodians would use against any of the, the uh, Yankee dogs that were trying to get into uh, uh, Cambodia. Uh, again, the Russian MiG-19 jet fighters uh, that were used. So leave that alone now. We were, you know, have seen Anger Wat, have seen all the wonderful places uh, that everybody wants to go to. So I really was more interested now going to the beach. So my question was, where is the good beach? And they said, Sihanoukville, where the arrow is down there. Sihanoukville, as you can see, is right at the border down there. One of the things, and I'm just going to talk about this for a second, that Sihanoukville now is the Cambodians are the only Southeast Asian country that has legalized gambling. So Sihanoukville, build, being on the coast, is now being built at a rate that is beyond anybody's understanding as the Las Vegas, the Macau of that area, because you're so close to China. So when we were there, there must have been 25, 30 casinos that I would go into just to walk in to see what it's like. All men smoking, all Chinese, just horrid. Uh, but Sihanoukville, if you saw the skyline, and I didn't take a picture of the skyline, is just one building after another being built, all casinos. And the interesting thing is that I found interesting was that eight hours a day, the Cambodians would work because they're very gentle, very easy people. But the Chinese would work 16 other hours of the day building these casinos. So they're building it, being built 24 hours a day by mostly Chinese developers because the, the Ch Cambodians are legalized gambling in this town of Sihanoukville. So in the future, you're going to hear more about Sihanoukville. But it was relatively a benign beach town at one time.
So we arrived in Sihanoukville and I didn't take a lot of pictures because it was so horrendously horrible as far as uh, the terrible roads, the construction, the amount of casinos going up. Uh, just, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So my interest was, where is there a good beach? And everybody says, go out to, to a place called Korang. So we went down to the wharf and obviously we weren't the only people wanting to go to Korang. <laughs> and so there's our boat and we're now going to go out so and it says in the boat when on boat please wearing airbags obviously they never got an american or an english person to translate it but uh it was interesting so we took the ferry ride out to korong the nice thing about the island of korong when you arrive the only way to get there is by boat um, or parachute in because there are no roads on Korong. So Korong is what we all think in our minds of these beautiful Cambodian beaches, because here is a beach that there are no um, there are no cars. Um, everything is transported by boat. So you come in by boat, you get transported down the beach to your hotel by boat, or you walk along the beach. So our hotel we stayed in, I booked this before I got there, obviously, and I had no idea what we were going to get, was this really cute place on the beach with this beautiful little uh, pool and uh, overlooking the uh, the water. So we stayed there a couple of days, but it turned out again that uh, because when you do things on the fly, about the second or third day, uh, we were not allowed to stay there because they were booked from that point on. So we found another place further down on the beach um, and uh, um, you could see it in the background there um, again no road so you can't uh, drive down to check it out you got to take a boat down to see it and we ended up going to a place called Dolphin Bay Resort because they had a vacancy so we stayed there a couple of days and this was not not something that most ladies would like but for um, <laughs> men who just looking for a bed and a shower this is you know a 25 dollar a night place right on the beach beautiful beach and great food and uh but it was called the dolphin bay so here's my brother and my friend dan we'd wake up in the morning with our cup of coffee and you'd sit out and watch the sun come up uh or go out and go swimming whatever you wanted to do but this is Korong. it's just a beautiful place so we left Korong and uh, got back onto the mainland, back onto Sihanoukville. And from Sihanoukville, right now they don't have, or didn't have at the time last year or two years ago, a flight from Sihanoukville to Bangkok. So I said, well, how do we get back? Well, how we get back is by bus. So we jumped on this bus. And so for four hours, there was a sign at the end of my uh, seat. It said no smoking and basically no uh, whatever. <laughs> um, oh my right. God. So as we get as we get <laughs> out my, with that. right an hour into the trip, uh, again it's ninety degrees. The bus is going up and down these hills. We pull over for a short little uh, stop, and the bus driver gets out. And I noticed that he's at the back of the bus with the engine open and he's got buckets of water. He's throwing water onto the radiator to cool the bus down <laughs> because you can think of a, you know, a bus full of people, 90 degree heat, humid, <laughs> going up and anyway, um, it was just interesting. So we arrived in Bangkok. So now we're back in Bangkok. I need to go to the restroom. This was, I find very amusing. Outside of one of the bathrooms they had, uh, Happy moment, obviously very descriptive because if you're gonna go, you know, you're always looking for a place to go. So this was your happy moment. So we arrived in Bangkok and from Bangkok, we took a, again, a taxi from Bangkok down this line. And I wanted to go to a town called Chunburi because I had heard about this place. Um, and this was an amazing place that Again, Chinese tourists are all over this, but no, no uh, non-Asian people are here. So very, I mean, there are a few, but I mean, it's, it's thousands of, of Asians. So this man, his name is Nung Nuk, which really doesn't mean anything to you, but it's a man who in the 60s bought 500 acres in outside of Chunbori, 
and he loved plants. And so he started to import plants. And then he made this Disneyland in Chunbori that you can walk around. And this is the beginning of it. So Chunbori, you can start to see it a little bit in the background. You can start to see some of the dinosaurs. He called it a dinosaur park. So, but he loved plants. So this was the back end of his plant, of his plant area, because I wanted to see what type of plants is he growing. So he doesn't grow five or six, <laughs> it was just, it was crazy. So this plant, and I, and I never got the English version of it. So you can see that he's growing them. It grows uh, on these pods. So he needed some cactus plants. This is called a barrel cactus, which some of them, us have in our yards, but he didn't just have five, you know, hundreds of these. So the park, the main theme of the park are for kids, and it is for, uh, it's called Dinosaur Park, because as you come around, some of these dinosaurs move, some of them make noises, so it's just a depiction of, uh, it's, a, it's an odd depiction, but it's a reason for him to have his his horticulture and all of his plants and get people to go there. So <laughs> these are all made out of little concrete pieces, but actually very well done. So as you walk around the park, this is just a, this was for me very, again, very interesting because here you have a Muslim woman with a son with a Batman, Spider-Man outfit <laughs> and the daughter in the background, again, modestly dressed, uh, but in a Thai dinosaur park. I mean, it was, it was so many things in my brain that it trying to put it together. <laughs> it was just, it was so interesting to me. So this, again, this uh, dinosaur park, I wanted to see his, he's playing around with cactuses. So the man is uh, very interesting because he's taking and, and uh, taking and, and morphing some of these cactuses. He, he's cutting them off and growing cactus and other cactuses on top. You're not looking for the whistle. No. Yeah. So anyway, this is the end of the dinosaur park as you're moving. What are you again. looking for? Anyway, huge park. So we, in Chanbori, again, uh, Buddha is very important. So we want to see what their Buddha uh, temples were. This was a Buddhist temple on the top of a hill uh, with some of the configurations. As this was the walkway up, this was one of the few Buddhist uh, facilities you could walk up to that you could see I have shoes on. Because almost all the Buddhist temples that you go to, you can't wear shoes. I also wanted to see, and this is Ranger will appreciate this, I wanted to see, what do they do with boats? So here is your boat yard. And so um, obviously a little more crude than ours, but most of the fishing boats there are wooden fishing boats. So here they are cleaning the bottoms, keeping these wooden fishing boats from sinking um, and scraping them of barnacles. So Bangkok, there, here we are now in Bangkok, and uh, Bangkok, one of my favorite towns, this is the top of one of the um, uh, restaurants, it's actually a hotel below, but a restaurant above, which is just spectacular in the evening to sit outside, so we had dinner up there overlooking Bangkok in the evening in the free air. Again, Bangkok, and I mentioned this last time, <laughs> very heavily Buddhist, even to the point where McDonald, outside of every McDonald's, is a Buddhist McDonald's standing there with his prayer and, and being respectful as you come in. So Bangkok, as you go through it, there is a river called the Chow Prong River, and it's obviously uh, goes to the Thai, Gulf of Thailand. But to get around, I hired this guy, and I said, you know, take me to what the Chong Prong has to offer. So interesting boats. Again, you'll appreciate this right here. But uh, there is a uh, an engine, a V8 engine on the back of this on a pivot. And this guy maneuvers this V8 with an outdrive. You can see the stainless steel outdrive to a propeller. And this is how you get up and down the river as you move around with a V8 engine that is just extremely powerful, moving you around. So one of the things he took us to was the largest reclining Buddha in uh, Thailand, which is in Bangkok. 
he took us up to a place called Wat Arun, which is also known as the Temple of Dawn. It's a 17th century uh, temple. Um, it is just an unbelievable place. Um, again, a, a Buddhist temple, um, and you can walk up this. These are all small ceramic tiles that have been put there, but you can see the monkeys and you can see the gods and um, it, it's, 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 it's not to be missed. This is again the same temple area. It's a large temple um, and it's, it's what everybody sees if you just go to Bangkok, you go to Wat Arun. So here we are at the airport and going back home. So again, Thailand has a spectacularly beautiful modern airport. Uh, so if any of you arrive, it's not backwards. It's absolutely first class. Um, this is basically the end of this trip. Um, I'm going to, at the end of this, uh, I put a couple of other slides and I did this for Mitsu because Mitsu and I were talking and there is a, an artist that I guess, and Mitsu can tell you more about in a second, that, uh, um, he commissioned. So I'm going to let give this to you, Mitsu. Are you going to pass it off? <laughs> I'm going to pass it to you. You can, you have more description than I do. Okay, this, well, I'll give you, if you don't want to say anything, the beginning of this, this is an artist that Mitsu met. And this type of art is called batik. And so, Mitsu, please say something because I would like you to say, explain. Well, this is a famous artist, but I didn't know he was famous. But I was on an Asian tour and I went to all those places you did, but uh, it was an educator's tour. So, uh, our group was made up of English teachers and artists. And we went to all the different places in, in Asia to look for artists. And this one is a famous artist who. His work is being owned by just about everybody. In fact, Nixon got some of his stuff. Nixon was there as well, but way back then. But anyway, uh, his name is, um, I, I just call him Mr. Ting, Ting, and he does batik. And I don't know, if, do any of you know what a, what a batik is? Yeah. Oh, I'm just talking to myself here then. But batik oh. is a, it's, it's a, deals with wax and paint. And what you don't want painted, you wax it over. Here's a batik here he's showing now. And this is the one I, I commissioned. It took him a year to do this one. And I, he fi finally sent it to me. But um, he has shows all over the world. But he passed away in, in 2008. He was born in 1914. And this is on a little island called Penang off of Malaysia. And when I say the, the artwork is, is done by using wax and oils and and what, what you do is what you don't want painted you wax over which and then uh, once once you paint it then you melt the wax and then you paint some more what you want and cover the rest so it's a call of wax resists and they do this multiple times until they get the show or the art that they want so in any way can you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> yep, yep. But okay. Mitsu, this is, this is, you need to tell people, this is the Mona Lisa hanging in your house. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason I got interested in it is that two months ago, I was watching the, it's called a road show. I don't know if you've ever watched that. People yep. bring in their artwork and they have people in there that um, evaluate and give you, uh, you know, if it's worth anything, if it's worth something and how much you should insure it for. I saw a similar piece like this. It, it was valued at $10,000. And he said you should insure it for at least that. But he does have a lot of his items now that's being auctioned off at Christie's. Um, but anyway, if you want to see some of his work, just all you have to do is get on a computer and look for Ting, T E N G. His first name is Chua, C H U A H, Chua Ting. And you'll see all his stuff. Um, it's it's in museums and it, it also it's on it's, it's on auction. His work is on auction. You can purchase it if you want. Yeah, this I realized that I got one of those is because of the artist on our trip. Like I said, the, the trip was made up of high school art teachers, and they knew pretty much what they wanted to see. Because at the same trip, I also bought a couple of other items. One, I bought a um, Japanese scroll in Japan. It was 110 years old. And I was trying to get it framed. They said, because of what it is, 
it's gonna cost two to four thousand dollars to frame it. <laughs> the cheapest bid was two thousand dollars to frame that piece of art. And so I haven't had a frame yet. I'm still trying to assess that. Um, I also bought some other pieces of artwork on this trip. And like I said, I was a beginning artist, so I didn't know much about these artists, but the people did, the teachers knew where to go. And so I just follow along with them. The primary purpose of the trip was, was an art, it was to visit schools. So I went to a number of um, graduations in Korea. I went to visit students in Japan and also uh, went to the Philippines as well. And um, But we went all the places that you were talking about. And I also did, a, uh, before it was legal, I did a temple rubbing at Angkor Wat. And I was <laughs> telling Barry, I'm not sure where I put it. I stored it someplace, but I can't find it yet. But I actually did a temple rubbings of Angkor Wat. So I took, in fact, a lot of us did. We took our paper and brought our charcoals and did the rubbings at Angkor Wat before, be, before it became illegal <laughs> to do that. So, but anyway, I didn't realize that this artist Ting, if you're interested, you can get on his, the website or just, just put in your computer, put Chua Ting and his file will come up. And you can see he has hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of work that he's done that you can purchase or you can go to auction and see if you can purchase it. It's just but anyway. His, yes. his use of colors. Um, I mean, I, I've looked at some of his, and this piece I've got up right now is one of my absolute favorites. It, uh, it's such, it's, it's, it's amazing what he, what he was able to do. I think this piece was up for auction at, um, it's Christie's. It's in Christie's of New York or something. This particular piece. Mine wouldn't be on auction because mine was uh, commissioned and no one saw it except myself and the artist because he had to keep sending slides back and forth to me to make sure I liked it. And then when, when I liked it, I just sent him back the slide and he did, finished it. The fact that you had somebody that you could actually talk to me, so that was the unbelievable, the artist, right? Yeah, well, he sent me a, a nice letter about the progress of the artwork, but you know, the letter is worth something now besides the, the painting because he passed away. But he sent me a note and he wanted to know if I liked the progress. <laughs> I told him I liked it. So anyway, that's about it. Good. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, Mitsu. It was I, I I just love the artwork and the fact that you have owned a piece is uh if anyone's piece. interested in Batik, look up his name, you'll see other Batik artists. Just that's look up for yeah. Ting, T E N G. Okay. Anyway, I really enjoyed your trip because I, I did the same thing you did. Thank you, Mitsu. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Really, Wait, really great. I don't know if you have any questions, but uh, if you do, I'll hang out for a few minutes. But it, it's uh, it's an amazing, not to be missed, if you ever have a chance for the last $800 you've got, and a couple of hundred dollars there, it's, uh, it's it's an amazing part of the world. Marty, how did you do? Sorry, I'll go ahead. Those trees at Angkor Wat, you know, that came over the buildings, like at your back there, uh, yep. by, at the top, was there branches coming out of the, at the top? Yeah, well, the tree, that's the it bottom. Like roots. That's the root system at the bottom. It's trying to get down to, because obviously there's no nutrition in the, in, in the wall, so it's trying to get down to the ground, and the tree is actually above. You'll the, the trees are, are, are huge. They're like giant um, 